Well, thank you very much for the introduction and for the invitation to be here uh, tonight uh, at the Union. I want to talk a little bit about uh, the prospects for America uh, in the world over the next four years. Uh, it's uh, particularly opportune to be here the day after President Obama's second inaugural address where he proved himself uh, to be a student of the form of literary criticism known as deconstruction, uh, which is much the same thing that uh, happens in American constitutional law when liberal judges get their hands on the Constitution. And what that means is you take words and pour their meaning out of them and substitute your own meaning for those words. Uh, it's a skill uh, of the, the most noted propagandist of the 20th century, and I think President Obama proved that he was their uh, equal yesterday. Uh, and some of the things he talked about very briefly in that address I want to cover here, and I think you'll see that, uh, that it forms a pattern uh, that has uh, informed his decision-making on national security affairs in his first four years and therefore likely to do so in the second four and touches directly uh, on the issue of American exceptionalism and how he sees uh, that uh, concept and how it affects his foreign policy and in, in many other aspects. Uh, the question of Obama's foreign policy is obviously important in the short term and has been for four years and will be for four more. But it's not dispositive of the direction of America over the long term. Uh, so for those of you who are uh, of a social democratic inclination, uh, I'm sure you're very happy today uh, uh, because Obama is the best president you're ever going to get. Uh, for those of you who take a somewhat different view of America's role in the world, as I do, uh, this is going to be a long four years. But it's not irreparable, at least I don't think so yet. So let me talk a little bit about Obama and what distinguishes him, I think, from the long line of recent presidents, uh, both Democratic and Republican, and how uh, that has affected his conduct of foreign affairs. The most basic point is that Obama really doesn't care that much about foreign policy. He has to deal with it when he has no alternative. But his real priority is domestic policy. He said in the 2008 campaign that his objective, his words, was to fundamentally transform America. And that remains his objective. And if you look at the uh, word count of the inaugural address yesterday, it was a brief address, but national security issues uh, comprised two paragraphs of the entire address. And that is uh, as good a proof as I think you can get that Obama just fundamentally uh, lacks interest in foreign policy, number one. Number two, uh, he doesn't see uh, the rest of the world as terribly threatening or challenging to American interest. He spoke during the 2008 campaign and during his first four years uh, about uh, the uh, war on terror essentially being over, uh, which is interesting since uh, we've seen uh, in, in the months since he accepted the Democratic Party's nomination for a second term, the American ambassador to Libya and three others killed. We've seen a hostage taking in Algeria with at least 37 uh, uh, foreigners killed. We've seen the French go into operations in Mali. Uh, the president may think, as he said yesterday, a decade of war is now ending, but the terrorists didn't get the memo, uh, and the war is still very much on. I think the president believes that American decline is natural and something he can accept, uh, and not something that, uh, that concerns him greatly. Now, in days of yore, a president with those characteristics in the American political context would be an isolationist, but not Barack Obama. He is uh, a true multilateralist. And that's expressed, I think, very graphically in his advice to David Cameron about the UK's role in the European Union. 
an issue which for most Americans, I have to confess, uh, rates somewhere below the bottom of the radar screen, but was important enough to Obama in the midst of his otherwise uh, lack of interest about foreign policy uh, to comment on, to have his aides comment on publicly. Now, when you put all this together, uh, I think uh, you can see that Obama uh, is really the first post-American president. In the same way that uh, citizens of European countries talk about going beyond nationalism uh, in uh, the European Union, uh, Obama is beyond nationalism in the American context. And he fundamentally does not believe in American exceptionalism. Although, as I said when I started, he used the word in his uh, inaugural address yesterday, but with a very different kind of meaning. Now, I understand that for many people, uh, American exceptionalism uh, is an offensive concept. That people think when we say uh, that we believe in American exceptionalism, uh, that it's a statement of arrogance, of superiority. Uh, I don't believe that's the case at all. I think it is a historical reflection of the difference of the American experience, certainly in contrast to the European experience. Uh, and in fact, it was something that uh, the earliest settlers in America, uh, who after all came from here, so if, if it's a problem, it's your fault, not ours. Uh, when the pilgrims came, John Winthrop, the first governor of Plymouth Colony, said, uh, we must consider that we shall be as a city upon a hill. And obviously he was quoting scripture. Uh, it's something that uh, has always appealed to Americans. Uh, Ronald Reagan, the only politician I know who can improve on scripture, used to call us a shining city on a hill. Uh, others use the phrase New Jerusalem. Uh, but it was the notion that we had come to America, by and large, uh, on our own. Um, and the idea that that is different from populations and territory in Europe, uh, I think, is clear. And, you know, ironically, the first person to comment on American exceptionalism was a Frenchman, Alexis de Tocqueville, uh, who said in Democracy of America, the position of the Americans is therefore quite exceptional, and it may be believed that no democratic people will ever be placed in a similar one. Because he saw in the first half of the 19th century the difference in the American experience to that point. Now, Obama was asked during his first visit to Europe as president if he believed in American exceptionalism, and he gave a classic Obama answer. He said, Yes, I believe in American exceptionalism, just as the Brits believe in British exceptionalism and just as the Greeks believe in Greek exceptionalism. In the first third of the sentence, uh, he said, yeah, I believe in it. So those who say I don't are wrong. But in the second two thirds of the sentence, he took it back. You know, there are 193 members of the United Nations. He could have gone on just as the Burkino Fasians believe in Burkino Fasian exceptionalism, just as the Papua New Guineans believe in Papua New Guinean exceptionalism. Obviously, if everybody is exceptional, nobody is exceptional. And I think that post-American expression uh, is something that many people saw in Obama uh, right from the beginning. Uh, in fact, when he spoke at the D-Day anniversary, in uh, 2009, an uh, uh, American uh, reporter commented on his speech at D-Day, uh, comparing it to Reagan's famous speech in 1984. This is Evan Thomas of Newsweek uh, said, making this contrast between 2009 and 1984, uh, he said, well, we were the good guys in 1984. It felt that way. It hasn't felt that way in recent years. So Obama's had really a different task. Reagan was all about America. Obama is, we are above that now. We're not just parochial. 
We're not just chauvinist. We're not just provincial. We stand for something. I mean, in a way, Obama's standing above the country, above, above the world. He's sort of God. He's going to bring all the different sides together. Now, leaving the reference to God aside, which is a little over the top even for the mainstream American media, uh, that is a view, I think, very descriptive of Obama's view of himself. Uh, and Newsweek hasn't changed their mind. The cover of their website for inaugural week is a picture of Obama looking up, and the headline is, The Second Coming. Now, Obama is not the first leader of the Democratic Party to think this way. He is the first one to be elected president. George H.W. Bush said of his opponent, Michael Dukakis, in 1988, saying of Dukakis, he said, he sees America as another pleasant country on the UN roll call, somewhere out there between Albania and Zimbabwe. And that is an accurate description of Obama's view as well. Th this is the difference in the Obama approach uh, that I think has dominated his uh, national security decision making in the first four years and it will dominate it in the second four years as well. This stands in direct contrast to the Reagan view of the world, which can be summarized uh, as believing in the idea of peace through strength. That a strong America leading a strong system of alliances can dissuade or deter adversaries from engaging in conflict so that we can achieve our interest uh, without uh, conflict. And obviously, uh, that's the most uh, uh, important objective uh, of all of them. Uh, I think that, uh, that Obama thinks that American strength is provocative, that we are the cause of much of the trouble in the world, so that a declining America a less assertive America will lead to a more peaceful world. I think that's 180 degrees the wrong direction. I think it's weakness that's provocative. It's weakness that invites challenge. Uh, and in that respect, uh, Obama has been an extraordinarily uh, provocative president. And let's just run through some of the examples of how Obama has performed uh, in the first term. Uh, and see what it implies in a second term. When Obama started uh, in relations with Russia, you'll recall he wanted to press the famous reset button because our relations with Russia were so bad. Now, and they were bad. And why were they bad? Because of Russia's policies, because of its assertiveness in the former republics of the Soviet Union. Obama gave Russia a very disadvantageous treaty on strategic weapons. He gave Russia a retreat from national missile defense uh, facilities in Poland and the Czech Republic. He stopped pressing Russia on its efforts to influence uh, countries in the near abroad. Uh, you'll remember in 2008, in August, when Russia and Georgia were engaged in hostilities. Obama called on both parties to exercise restraint. Now, I'm sure if you were in Georgia, that was a very cheering prospect, that you would exercise restraint and wait for Russia to do so as well. But that's what Obama did. He did this again and again and again. And what did we get back from Russia? Just within the past five weeks, President Putin and Foreign Minister Lavrov have both said that the reset policy has not worked, and that our relations uh, with, uh, between Washington and Moscow are at a very low ebb. That's what the reset button gets you. Three vetoes by Russia of Security Council sanctions against Assad, uh, continued flying of political cover for Iran's nuclear weapons programs, uh, continued efforts to reestablish Russian hegemony in the space of the former Soviet Union. That's what uh, a policy of weakness uh, toward a country like Russia produces. Let's take China as an example, uh, where uh, we essentially have no strategy with respect to China. 
with respect to Russia, we had the wrong strategy. China, there's no strategy at all. And what has China been doing, not just the past four years, but before? It's been expanding, modernizing its ballistic missile and nuclear uh, weapons forces. It's been modernizing and improving its conventional forces. It has developed the world's most sophisticated cyber warfare capability. Uh, it's building uh, area denial and anti-access weapons capabilities to push uh, foreign navies back from the western rim of the Pacific, where they have guarded and made stable, important sea lanes of communication since World War II. China has made assertive, even belligerent claims, territorial claims in the South and East China Sea, to the point where uh, the new Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe uh, said uh, uh, last week that the South China Sea uh, was looking like it would become Lake Beijing. Our response to all this, uh, no response. So you find the countries of South, Southeast Asia, East Asia increasingly worried about America's posture, especially when they look at the massive defense budget cuts amounting, if the sequestration takes effect in six weeks, to a trillion and a half dollars of reductions, not counting the cost of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, when every other department of the U.S. federal government has increased expenditures Department of Defense expenditures have gone down a trillion and a half dollars. Uh, and our Navy, with 285 ships at sea, is at a level that has not been seen since 1916. 1916. Now, this subject came up in the debates between Obama and Romney. Uh, and in response to the question about the level of the U.S. Navy, Obama responded with, snark. He said to Romney, oh, but you know, our ships today are much more powerful than the ships of 1916. Well, no kidding. And if there's ever a war, the ships they will face in combat will be much more powerful than the ships of 1916. This is a reflection of Obama's not just disinterest, but his disdain for most military matters. Now, in the area where I think uh, of most immediate concern he has failed the most has been dealing with the issue of terrorism. He hasn't wanted to talk about a global war on terror. He's tried to act like the, uh, the Arab Spring is going to bring sweetness and light and democracy to the Middle East uh, instead of radical regimes that threaten regimes that are friendly to the United States, Israel, and Arab regimes. Uh, he has not seen the risk uh, to ourselves and our allies from the continued growth and strength of terrorism. Uh, his entire approach to terrorism rests on the killing of Osama bin Laden. Now, let's be clear, this was an unequivocally good thing to do. But it was a decision that would have been made by 99.99% of the American population. To hear Obama tell it, he did everything but fast rope out of that helicopter with the Navy SEALs. Whereas, in fact, he was the beneficiary, politically, of 10 years of effort. It's roughly the equivalent of looking back to 1969 when Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin landed on the moon in the summer of that year during the Nixon presidency, if Nixon had said, I put men on the moon, when in fact the program had started 10 years before when John Kennedy said it would be our objective to land uh, men on the moon and bring them back safely within the decade. Nixon was there when it happened, just like Obama was there when it happened. Beyond that, the policy against terrorism, uh, I think, has been uh, successful only in the sense of killing a number of al-Qaeda leaders in Waziristan. Everywhere else, we are in retreat. And if you needed any confirmation of that, what's happened in North Africa just in the past four months is proof. On September the 6th, Obama accepted the Democratic nomination for president and said, uh, Al-Qaeda's on the road to defeat. 
five days, five days before they killed Ambassador Stevens. Uh, and now we see with this hostage taking in Algeria, uh, a form of aggressive terrorist activity resulted in three dozen or more uh, non-Algerians being killed. We still don't know the number of Algerians that the terrorists killed there. And for the first time, uh, a major attack by terrorists in the region against an economic target. In Algeria previously, in the struggle between the military and the uh, Front for Islamic Salvation, the FIS didn't attack uh, economic targets because they wanted to inherit an Algeria that had a functioning economy. If oil and natural gas and other production facilities are now uh, targets for the terrorists, uh, all over the Middle East, uh, that is called into question. Uh, this is, I think, an example of how the terrorist threat has metastasized. It has not been dealt with effectively, and it remains uh, an issue that will confront the United States and its friends, uh, as David Cameron said just a few days ago, for decades. Now, I've covered all of this and not gotten into the threat posed by a nuclear Iran and a nuclear North Korea. The threat of nuclear proliferation to me over the long term is worse than, worse than the short term threat of terrorism. And yet, uh, the Obama administration's response for the first four years and in get, again in the inaugural address yesterday is to urge diplomacy with the likes of Iran and North Korea. Here, here's the reality. Iran and North Korea are never going to be talked out of their nuclear weapons programs. They're not going to be bribed out of them. They're not going to be pressured out of them. Iran is perilously close to achieving what it's been after for 20 years, which is a deliverable nuclear weapons capability. Uh, I fear that what's really uh, underlying uh, the Obama administration approach is the idea that a nuclear Iran can be contained and deterred as we contained and deterred the Soviet Union during the Cold War. I think that's delusional. I think the mental calculus uh, of the mullahs in Tehran is radically different from the calculus of the communists in Moscow uh, during the Cold War. I don't think that the logic of deterrence works with them the same way. But even if I am completely wrong about that, even if you could contain and deter a nuclear Iran, it doesn't stop with Iran. Even Secretary of State Clinton has said that if Iran gets nuclear weapons, Saudi Arabia will get nuclear weapons, Egypt will, Turkey will, and perhaps others. So that in a very short period of time as these things go, you could have half a dozen or more nuclear weapon states uh, in the Middle East and that already incredibly volatile uh, region uh, will grow even more volatile. Uh, I think we have uh, an Israeli election today. We'll see what happens. Uh, but I think the Israelis have a, a very stark choice in front of them. The economic sanctions have done nothing uh, to slow down the Iranian nuclear program. I don't think there's any prospect uh, that they will have an effect on the nuclear program. Uh, so right now, the most likely outcome is that Iran gets nuclear weapons. There's only one thing that's going to stop it, and that's the preemptive use of military force against that program. I can guarantee you that the Obama administration will never use military force, which is why the spotlight is on Israel. And I think they've got a very short period of time uh, to decide. Uh, this is the sort of issue that Obama would just as soon not face. He'd much rather work on fundamentally transforming America. Uh, I think the question for Americans who have a different view, who believe that America's place in the world is critical to whatever order and stability there is, uh, and there's precious little of it, but without that order and stability, the prospect of global anarchy, or the prospect of others who do not have as benign a view uh, of uh, Western values will take its place. So that if we can get through 
the next four years uh, without, uh, uh, without disabling ourselves, uh, then I think there's a prospect uh, to get back on the road uh, to keeping a more stable world. But as far as I'm concerned, the 2016 election cannot come soon enough. Thank you very much.